for, to build some infrastructure from Elba Island into Atlanta um, was to enable Elba gas or this liquefied natural gas to get into the, um, make it available on a firm basis into the state for residential and firm service customers. And the market opportunity for that has passed, um, but what hasn't passed is certainly the opportunity for us to think about what other innovative ideas there might be um, in terms of infrastructure to create value for Georgians. Would you say in Georgia that it's, it is easier or more difficult to build intrastate pipelines as opposed to interstate pipelines, or, or is, it, is it about the same? Um, it, it is more difficult to build intrastate pipeline facilities. Um, on an interstate basis, the um, pipelines are able to go out, much like a, a strip shopping center, and find their anchor tenants, be it a power generator, be it an industrial customer, be it a utility, or some combination of those. And they can do that under the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's guidelines. Um, for an, to build an intrastate facility for utility, um, we would basically have to go build it and then go file a rate case. Um, the capital ex expenditures are such that it would require the utility to go file a rate case. And if you're like this utility who agreed to a five-year stay out, um, my incentive would be not to be too innovative and I'd have to wait until I had a rate case anyway to even be able to think about doing it. And I don't have those sophisticated um, users, if you will, on the end. You know, I have residential and small business customers who expect and should expect their heat to come on and their water heaters to work. If, if we wanted to try to meet demand for natural gas in Georgia the next, say, 20 to 30 years or 50 years, how much more, in your estimation, intrastate capacity would we need versus what we have today? If you can quantify that in a percentage, how much percentage more or <laughs> however we might be able to understand it. Yeah. yeah well, we talked about the the, the growth in the area, it, it's a bit difficult to quantify on a one-to-one -one basis in that um, residential customers use gas predominantly in January and February for heating, so it's very peaky, if you will, and they use very little in the summertime. Um, industrial users have used about the same amount every month, little variation, and then the, the commercial, even a, a different variation of that. So. We, like the electric industries, build a portfolio of different types of storages. Some are one-day storages. Some are storages that you use over days. Some of them are um, contracts for pipeline that are 365-day services. So what we try to do is build the portfolio that says you will have the reliability when you need it so that you're not paying for it 365 days a year. And so it's hard, it's hard just to do a one-to-one -one comparison because the type of users and when they use it. on a, it's hard to relate that back to just the pipeline. Having, having answered that, um, going back to interruptibles, whether you model it after your explanation you just said or there's actually more physical capacity, more interstate pipeline capacity out there, if there was more capacity, would that, would that lessen the interruptible possibilities out there? If there were more capacity, would that would they have less concern that they're going to be interrupted if there were more infrastructure capacity out there? Yeah, if, if there was um, additional interstate capacity would be the first thing that we would look at. The second thing we would look at would be diversity of interstate capacity. Uh, the, the risk of them being um, curtailed or interrupted um, or reduced, yes. So, so in other words, that would be good for future economic development yes. if, if that security blanket was there. Yes. Uh, real quickly before we let you go, what about any, assuming that you can do uh, add some infrastructure now, what type of tax incentives exist for you now for your capital investments and if none, what, what would help? And the, there's not tax incentives in terms of incenting us to go out and invest in infrastructure today. Um, the, there we are taxed in terms of our plant, um, yes, and yes, that could be incentive in terms of the investments that are made. Well, any, any thoughts you might have on that, on how there could be some kind of tax incentives? We'd, you know, we would like to get that information if you could get that to us. Um, 
and it'd be, I think it would help us help, help the state. Any other questions from committee members? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much Thanks for your time. And thank you. Um, next is uh, Tom Jankowski with uh, Singular Wireless. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, committee members, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Again, my name is Tom Jankowski, and I'm with Singular Wireless. I'm a member of their external affairs group. I've been there with Singular and Bell South for over 15 years. For nearly 22 years, Singular Wireless has called Georgia home, beginning in 1984 as a small wireless company called Bell South Mobility, which I'm sure many of you remember. But with only 12 employees and serving customers, with phones costing over $3,000 each and weighing about three pounds. Today our phones weigh less than three ounces, cost significantly less, and run on a deployed high-speed data network at over 300 kilobits per second here in Metro Atlanta. Certainly, a lot has changed in 20 years. From the early stages of cellular service for today's array of personalized multimedia products, Singular has been at the forefront of the wireless frontier right here in Georgia. Today it's hard to remember a time without wireless service. Nearly all business sectors here in Georgia have embraced wireless communications as a way to increase productivity, enhance their services, and it is caused an evolution in continuing to change the way many people do their jobs. Georgia's world-class wireless infrastructure is a model for the United States and is also a major selling point to attracting new businesses to our state on a daily basis. From transportation to hospitality and from healthcare to education, wireless communications is integral to our work, our homes, our education, and our lives. Wireless technology is being utilized right here on the Georgia Tech campus in ways we never envisioned just a few short years ago. But you know, we need to stop and look back and ask ourselves, why has this occurred? Innovation, job creation, and productivity gains don't just happen. They are a direct result of state and local policies that can either foster growth or stifle it. Georgia has chosen to foster growth and to encourage competition. And here we are today with one of the most highest wireless usage rates in the nation, a strong economy, and a high-speed communications availability to urban and increasingly to rural areas. So the best incentive for business has worked. And since 1996, one example of Georgia's leadership in emerging, in encouraging an environment of innovation and competition has been the best credit. A principal goal of the BEST program was to encourage deployment of broadband infrastructure and technology, and it has worked. Due to the BEST program, Metro Atlanta has recently cited as having the highest cell phone usage in the nation. Georgia ranks number three in the nation in deployment and availability of broadband technology. BEST has boosted economic development and investment in Georgia and provided access to the latest technologies bringing new jobs and investment to Georgia each year. And finally, it has improved the standard of living for all Georgians by reducing the cost of wireless service so that today over 75% of Georgians use wireless communications nearly on a daily basis at work, school, or home. But as we meet here today, here on the campus of Georgia Tech, we are reminded that innovation and technology is a moving target. 
It is, and it's imperative that our state and local tax policies keep pace and continue to evolve as well. Best credits are a powerful invention and incentive for building new wireless tech networks and upgrading existing ones while deploying the latest advances in high-speed communications throughout Georgia. As you've probably already heard, best credits have become sometimes stranded when a company has credits and no income tax liability to apply them against. So how does this happen? Well, I can only speak to my industry, but wireless networks require a significant initial capital outlay. This involves planning, designing, and installing systems that in many cases take years before they can become profitable. Also, with today's accelerating technology obsolescence, this capital will have a shorter payback period, together causing credits to become stranded for several years after their initial investment. But best credit, credits do make a difference. With an average wireless tower and associated investment costing approximately $300,000 to $400,000, the best credit could yield an estimated cost savings of $15,000 to $20,000. That matters, especially in parts of a state where new and enhanced infrastructure is needed and where the payback is modest. A company which can take $20,000 in credit one year of the investment can afford to roll out service in locations that would otherwise not be as economically viable. The best credit helps accelerate the capital investment process through the state, resulting in more innovation and technology sooner while increasing state and local tax revenue fiscal, fiscally and sales, and sales and property tax revenues for years to come. But in order to optimize this accelerated investment environment, the best program used is more, needs to be more closely linked to the time periods for which the in, in, industry's investment is actually made. Today, best credits can be stranded and unrealized for many years after the initial investment is made. It is our hope that the best credit will be enhanced so that the investment credits can be realized more concurrently with the investment. One such way would be to allow companies that have earned the best credit through their investments the option to realize this credit as an offset or credit to their existing Georgia payroll withholding tax liability. Matching the timing of best credits more closely with the capital investment not only accelerates the investment process in this highly competitive industry, but is in keeping with the original intent of the best program. It is also consistent with Georgia's leadership in fostering competition, innovation, and technology throughout the state of Georgia. So just as technology and innovation are constantly evolving, so too must we always be vigilant to help ensure that our state and local policies continue to foster an environment that will nurture economic growth and improve the standard of living for all Georgians. I urge consideration of this proposed enhancement to the best program to allow credit against Georgia payroll withholding tax to keep Georgia as a leader in attracting and encouraging innovation and technology for all Georgians now and for many years to come. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I'm open to any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Any questions? Um, you got a question? Tom, you perhaps uh, address this, I apologize, I had to step out for a moment, but technology has always been big, and, and I know people take for granted what, uh, what your organization, Singular Wireless, does, how technologically involved it is from the, the transfers to the, the things you do in the back office. Um, is, is there anything specifically that, that we don't do well enough in Georgia or, or something that we could do on the technology side? To, to try to make it more attractive. I mean, you know, technological jobs, service jobs, those are good jobs to have in Georgia. Is there anything that we could do to uh, attract more of that type of business to Georgia and, and make a business case for that as, as we look forward at, at, uh, as a business incentive study committee uh, for a long term? Well, well certainly Georgia's been very successful at attracting wireless telecommunications. I mean, we have a highly competitive market here certainly in Atlanta and throughout Georgia. Um, but I, 
I, I guess what I would, would say is that um, the Georgia's tax environment is generally fairly favorable. And, uh, and the largest obstacle to um, larger deployment is really just the, uh, the ability to, uh, as, as, as with this best credit, to more closely match the uh, incentive with the investment so that our decision makers, our network folks who are building out our networks can say, oh yeah, here's a real credit, here's something I can really understand instead of saying, well, maybe 10 years down the road I might get this incentive. It's, it's the real-time nature of our credits that I think will attract not only more investment by wireless, but then users of the technology, as in hospitality, healthcare, because people are very sophisticated and they know that where wireless networks exist. And so I think giving the industry the incentives to build it, they'll come. Uh, kind of picking up on that as well, through, throughout these meetings we've heard a number of people talk about uh, the tax credits being weighted against payroll withholding, which I think is a good idea. And you mentioned that also. I've heard mentioned, uh, not necessarily in these meetings, but the idea of taking these tax credits and bartering them from companies who cannot use them against income taxes and selling them to those more mature industries who perhaps can. Right. Any comments you might have on that? And one, would th is that a better idea than the weighing it against uh, payroll withholdings if you had to pick one of the two? Well, if I had to pick one of the two, I think using the payroll withholding is superior. And, and the reason I think it is is because it allows the um, the com competition, what I would call in its pure sense, to thrive, and that is the decision makers make the investment, they realize the credit, and just move on. There, there isn't a variable down the road, so, well, how much are we going to get for these credits? Are we going to actually be able to um, uh, get somebody to buy them? So I, I, I think the withholding credit gives something that people in these positions of investment want to have, and that's some greater certainty because there's, a, there's enough variables out there already. I'm glad to hear you say that. Okay. One, if, we, if we have time, and, and sure. you would. Uh, we had it in our Athens meeting, we had a gentleman talked about manufacturing, uh, uh, sales tax credit on manufacturing equipment, and basically we turned our auditors into engineers <laughs> when they go out to do an audit. Is right. it or is it not manufacturing equipment? Um, do you find that in, over on the technical, um, any, any of the tax credits related to you know, sales tax exemption or high tech? I mean, do, do, do we need, it seems to me that we need to simplify and, 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 and clarify that more by in statute yes. and not make our auditors lawyers yeah. or adversaries or well, uh, engineers. It, it, can you, I mean, does that, that make sense over in your side of the world a, as well? A, absolutely, and that, that's just to the, the, the point we made, and that is if you're at a point where you have auditors deciding or, or being helping the decision process as to whether or not that credit's going to be made. You, you've totally uh, pulled apart the whole investment credit kind of equation that really needs to drive these investments. It's um, audits happen every three, four years. You're so far down the road, it, it's, it's um, not optimal. Clarity, certainty, and timing, I think, are the, uh, the ideas that we, we'd like to see happen. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. Appreciate uh, next, uh, Jim Tinsley with uh, Alpha Results. Thank you, uh, Chairman Lewis and the Business Incentive uh, Legislative Study Committee. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jim Tinsley with Alpha Results, and our firm helps companies utilize tax credits. Uh, my focus today is on how businesses can utilize credits. In many cases, as we just heard, they qualify for the credits, but do not have enough offsetting tax income liability, and the credits become stranded. My intent is to provide a very high-level overview of these situations and follow up a little, at a later time if needed. 
Your committee is examining the role and value of business incentives and wants to determine if legislative changes are needed. We have a few suggestions we want to share with you, but first, I want to give you a little background. Uh, our company focuses on uh, Georgia-based, family-owned, small businesses. These include manufacturers, distributors, healthcare providers, professional service firms, and other tax-paying entities. These companies are located all parts of Georgia. I think most of them fit in the definition we heard from uh, Athens as existing industry. That is, they've been here for six months or more. And as you know, many of them have been around for generations. The majority of our clients are what are called pass-through entities, such as S-Corps, LLCs, partnerships. This means, bottom line, is that the tax for the businesses are paid by the individuals who own the, the businesses. They're paid for out of their back pockets themselves as individuals. They employ Georgia citizens and want to stay in Georgia. They've been here for the life of the company. Job creation and retention is important to their business. Survival is also important to Georgia. We also work very closely with local economic development officials, chambers of commerce, and CPA firms in assisting their constituents and clients in understanding these tax credits. In addition, we work closely with numerous departments in the state of Georgia, including Department of Revenue, Department of Technical Adult Education, Department of Community Affairs, and the Department of Economic Development to leverage these resources and to assist where it is available. Let me give you an overview to clarify uh, why we're here today. Most of the uh, tax credits are utilized against Georgia income tax liability when it's available. These credits become stranded, as you just heard, uh, when companies have qualified for the credit but do not have enough income tax liability, current or future. Don't have enough to use them effectively, that is, not worth the time, cost, energy to, in order to obtain them. This is a very common occurrence. Many companies and business owners, especially in the case of pass-through entities, are not paying enough state income taxes to use much of their credits. Often companies in a growth stage do not become profitable and thus don't owe income taxes until a few years later down the road. That basically destroys any intended incentive because companies won't add jobs or invest based on the possible credits way down the road. We've been asked many times by our clients, CPA firms, and others if there are additional ways to utilize these credits. Currently, tax credits can be utilized against withholding only for job credits when the company does not lease their employees. You might be familiar with a, uh, organization or, uh, a way of having your employees leased by another company. It's called a PEO, a professional employment organization. Uh, that prohibits you from being able to utilize the withholding credits. The other qualifiers include uh, it has to be located in a Tier 1 county, uh, located in a less developed census tract, or qualifies as a headquarters tax credit. Um, the resellable tax credits only currently today only applies to the film and low-income housing tax credits. I want to give you a, a few examples to clarify the situation. Uh, the first one is a business that's currently using the, the job tax credit against income and withholding. Uh, it's a South Georgia manufacturer, family-owned, growing food processor, and employing a little over 300 employees. It's a direct quote from the owner. Uh, the real incentive is when the cash is available to be used against the business. It is immediately allows you to add labor at a discount. If you're not in the fence about adding five, maybe ten employees, and you get a discount on that labor, that's a no-brainer. You go ahead and do it. Uh, they have reinvested in the tax, they have reinvested their tax credits back into the business by adding more employees and expanding their production a great beneficiary of, of utilizing the withholding tax credits. Uh, this is an example where the withholding could not be used because of the least employee situation I just described. Another South Georgia manufacturer, rapidly growing, uh, they manufactured cargo trailers with over 50 employees. They qualified for a little over $100,000 in tax credits, but can only use against the owner's individual income taxes. Uh, they're plowing money back as much as they can into the finance and their growth. This results in more jobs for the community. If the withholding option were available, they could hire more employees immediately. 
Last example I was going to go through was a health care provider, uh, which is installing a computer software system called Electronic Medical Records, or EMR. Uh, their goal is to lower the operating cost and improve their patient care. They would potentially qualify for the retraining tax credit due to employee training, but decided not to pursue this due to their low income tax liability. With the withholding option available, this provider would be able to increase the amount of employee training to better utilize this cost savings investment and possibly hire more employees. Based on our experiences with hundreds of these types of family owned businesses and feedback from economic development people and CBA firms, we don't want to present recommendations to this committee. Um, we respectfully request that the General Assembly favorably consider legislation to allow companies to have, quali to have qualified for the tax credits, such as the retraining, jobs, investments, and other credits, to utilize these tax credits not only for income taxes, but also uh, for payroll withholding and potentially for the resellable, resellable component. This would cover businesses who cannot utilize payroll withholding option due to leased employees, as I previously des described. In summary, Georgia businesses want to do exactly what the incentives are designed to do, add jobs, train employees, and invest in Georgia. It's just that many of these need a more realistic opportunity to re utilize these incentives and invest the proceeds back into Georgia again and again and again. We'll be more than pleased to assist you and your colleagues in every possible way to you consider this matter. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Any questions? Committee? Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming down, Jim, and presenting to us. Um, next on the agenda is Tom Midget with uh, Packaging Corporation of America. Tom, come on down. Tom, welcome. Go right ahead. Thank you very much. I am Tom Midget, and I am here today on behalf of Packaging Corporation of America. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I, neither I nor my children, I, with one exception of one year, uh, attended Georgia Tech. Uh, I do have an older son who did come for one year, but he decided he would move to the northern suburbs of Atlanta and complete his education at an Orange University. Uh, nevertheless, Packaging Corporation of America has a paper mill, one of the most basic of manufacturing facilities in Georgia, uh, a paper facility upon which a good portion of Georgia's manufacturing economy has been based throughout the state, from, from Augusta to Rome to Cedar Springs to Valdosta to Brunswick. The paper industry is, is in effect, a mature industry. Uh, the mill that pa Packaging Corporation of America has in Lowndes County is, is a little over 50 years old. Uh, PCA has reinvested many times the original cost of that facility uh, in trying to keep that facility competitive. Uh, we compete with other paper manufacturers in Georgia. We compete with other paper manufacturers in Alabama and Tennessee and Florida. We compete with other paper manufacturers throughout the world because, as you well know, some people can make paper in Indonesia and Malaysia and Brazil and put them on ships and bring it to this country and, and sell it for, for no more and, in some cases, less than we can make it right here and sell it. So we, we literally do compete in a true world environment. I want to emphasize one thing right here at the beginning of this proceeding. While you are a business incentives study committee, what I'm here to talk to you about is in no fashion, in my opinion, a business incentive. What I'm here to talk specifically to you about is a situation that makes Georgia unique in the southern United States and, and one of uh, only six or seven, maybe eight states in the entire country that place a state sales tax on energy used in the manufacturing process. 
Now, I know to some of you I'm speaking to the choir on this issue or singing to the choir, but the fact of the matter is uh, Georgia has a state-imposed 4% sales tax on energy used in the manufacturing process. I don't think that the elimination of that sales tax on energy used in manufacturing is in any fashion an incentive. It is strictly uh, an anchor, if you please, that Georgia manufacturers, manufacturers have or a rope that they have tying one of their competitive arms behind their back that makes them less competitive with other similar manufacturers in surrounding states uh, and throughout the country. It's nothing more than good economic policy, the removal of which will again make Georgia more competitive with its surrounding state neighbors. In the past two or three years, the state of Georgia has admittedly been receiving windfall revenues from the sales tax that it has on energy. Windfall revenues because energy costs themselves have skyrocketed. As you heard a prior speaker today, uh, natural gas prices have gone from three, four, or five dollars per decatherm to, in some cases, seventeen or eighteen dollars per decatherm. Oil prices have gone from uh, twenty to twenty-five dollars a barrel to seventy dollars a barrel. And, and I do want to add, when I speak about sales tax on energy, I don't mean just electricity. I don't mean just natural gas, because we do have manufacturers in this state, such as Packaging Corporation, that use a large amount of fuel oil. Some manufacturers use coal, all of which is taxed at 4% by the state of Georgia. The electricity which we purchase, and by the way, Packaging Corporation in Valdosta is one of the ten largest electric consumers on the Georgia power system in the entire state. A good portion of Georgia power's electricity, in fact, the large majority of Georgia power's electricity, is made from coal. They pay sales tax on the coal that they buy to make their electricity. Uh, the last number I heard was some $42 million a year Georgia Power pays the state in sales tax on coal that they buy to make electricity, which in turn is sold to us, which means we're paying a sales tax on the sales tax on the coal. The same is true uh, from the earlier speaker today regarding uh, railroads. We are a large user of rail, both inbound and outbound. In fact, there is a railroad, a short-line railroad, that is solely dependent on the Packaging Corporation of America Mill in Lowndes County. We ship chemicals in and out. We ship wood in and out. We ship paper in and out. The sales tax on the diesel fuel that the trains use to, to move those products in and out is, again, a, a tax on a tax, if you please, in that transportation service. By prompt action, the Georgia General Assembly and the administration can help mitigate the effect of exponential energy cost increases by supporting the immediate removal of the state sales tax on energy used in manufacturing and at least give Georgia manufacturers a 4% reduction in their effective energy costs. This sounds like a small amount. But with monthly energy costs in the millions of dollars for many manufacturers, this 4% is very real and very significant. The reasonable tax reform included in House Bill 209 that was introduced in the last session of the General Assembly, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for those who create and maintain the very jobs that are essential to Georgia's economy will only begin to make Georgia competitive with all its surrounding states and eliminate this burdensome tax which only Georgia levies in the entire southeast. Packaging Corporation of America through its Lowndes County paper mill manager Mike Senyard, who was unable to be here today because he's out of state, has spoken of the severity of this matter repeatedly, both in Valdosta, 
and in several appearances before legislative committees in Atlanta and Macon, Red Top Mountain, and others that, that Chairman Lewis, you, you have conducted, you probably think it's a broken record at this point. You've heard it several times. But nevertheless, you know, we can't make you understand and appreciate the severity of this situation. Relief, in our opinion, from this non-competitive, burdensome, and basically unfair tax is essential to the PCA mill's continued livelihood in Lowndes County. To put matters in perspective, PCA's Valdosta mill, <coughs> excuse me, purchases over $40 million worth of wood, that's 1,750 cords of wood a day, from surrounding area landowners every year. That's individual landowners. That's Farm Bureau members, that's small landowners that have planted pine trees 12, 15, 20, 22 years ago that are just now bringing them to market. We have an annual payroll of over $32 million. The average wage paid at that mill in 2005 was $62,000. The annual hourly wage was $62,000 per employee. And that's exclusive of benefits, uh, which average in excess of 40%. So, so we're in the, the $90,000 to $100,000 total annual per employee payroll cost at that facility where right now we employ 360 people. I might add that PCA also has a, a significant uh, facility here in Atlanta uh, where we make, from the liner board that is made in Valdosta, where we make what you would call a card, cardboard box or a corrugated box that is sold to, to any number of other uh, users here in, in Metro Atlanta. The PCA mill in Valdosta pays over $1.3 million in local ad valorem taxes every year. We're the largest taxpayer in Lowndes County. I've heard an argument made, as you have, Mr. Chairman, that to give a so-called tax break of this type to the paper industry or to any manufacturer uh, has a tendency to at least take money away from education. I guarantee you if that mill closes in Valdosta, if that mill closes in Valdosta, and that $1.3 million is taken out of the tax rolls of Lowndes County, that's going to have an impact on that local community too. Probably as much of an impact, if not more so, than whatever might happen here in Atlanta could have. So this is not just purely a state issue. It is a local issue, and it is a local issue that I'm proud to say the, the business community in particular and the local community in Valdosta and Lowndes County have, have rallied around and they appreciate the severity of the situation and as you and as have the administration, uh, the, the community there has, has spoken loudly and supportively of rectifying this, this inequitable taxing situation that we find ourselves in right now. PCA feels that we must make the leaders of our community and our state aware of the severity and the basic unfairness of this situation. It seems to us that if the state of Georgia can find unlimited money to help save other economically challenged companies, to even pursue NASCAR, bring new foreign automobile manufacturers into the state with hundreds of million dollars allegedly of incentives that it could also find, if necessary, the money within the ongoing operating budget to, to remove this burdensome sales tax on energy used in manufacturing. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that notwithstanding the success that Georgia has had in bringing new industry into the state, I've read where Georgia has lost over 150,000 manufacturing jobs in the last five years. Those are substantial paying jobs that are very likely gone forever. 
we don't want PCA's mill in Valdosta to be the next victim of Georgia's regressive industrial manufacturing tax structure. There's no doubt that absent meaningful tax reform, initially and immediately in the form of elimination of the sales tax on energy used in the manufacturing process, additional manufacturing jobs will in fact be lost to Georgia. I don't think it's the intention of anyone in this General Assembly or anyone in this governor's office to have that happen. I know it's not the intention of those of us who work every day in manufacturing, trying to remain competitive, trying to keep our suppliers and our employees happy and paid, and trying to be able to sell our Georgia products in an increasingly competitive market throughout the United States and the world. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your interest. Be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Tom. Any questions from the committee? Tom, I appreciate you coming down here and, and missing that because I know you had to miss the meeting in Athens that we had a few weeks ago, so we're certainly glad you, you came to express yourself on this. and and. We're going to look at that as a business incentive, as you know. Thank you. So thank you. Um, that concludes all of our presentations that we had uh, on the agenda today. Let me thank all of you for coming. That concludes our meeting. And it also concludes the meetings of this study committee. This was the fourth and final meeting. And, and as some would say, now the real work begins. Let, let me ask those of you, any of you who have any more comments or suggestions or information that you would like for this committee to receive, I would ask that you send that to Abby here. Most of you know how to contact her. And I would ask that you get that information to her by October 31st. I would like for that to be the deadline because we do have to have a report prepared, I think, by December the 1st. And that would give us a good a good 30 days to get that prepared so we can take that report and try to work out a good policy or some good legislation from that. So if you have anything you want to present, please do it by the 31st. I believe that's Tuesday of next week. It's also Halloween, so try to get that taken care of if you, if you have an interest. Um, I certainly want to thank the Georgia Tech. Betsy, thank you for putting all this facility here, putting this facility together, making it available to us. We certainly enjoyed it. It was an excellent place to have a meeting like this and very appropriate to have this topic here on this campus. So thank you for giving us this opportunity here. Uh, I want to recognize just a few others quickly. Brent and John in the back, y'all raise your hand. They're the guys video, videoing this over the internet. So everything that's been said here today and everything that's been done has been captured on the internet and that data has been, uh, is being stored so we have it to, to rely on when and if we need it. And of course, none of this would have been possible if it wasn't for Abby right here. Abby, throw your arm up. Abby has put all this together for all four meetings, done an outstanding job, made us look pretty good as much as she could and I know that's a tall order to do. But again, let me thank all of those, all of you who participated. You gave up your time and your day and your morning or your afternoon to come here and, and tell us what we as a state can do better to provide incentives, business incentives to you as, as entrepreneurs, as corporations, as business people and energy providers and new technology providers and educators even in this state. We appreciate that. That's stuff we need to know. And on behalf of the committee, I thank you, and at this point, we'll stand adjourned.